companies come out and talk to you, give like tech talks, information sessions on like the real world software. Um, this class or this uh, club doesn't focus on sort of the algorithm side of everything or problem solving. The theory. We saw hmm? the computer science theory. Yeah, the th we, yeah. We don't focus more. We don't focus on the theories. We kind of focus on more of the real world application of everything. Um, we're starting. You guys are welcome to find a seat up here. Uh, so this uh, first tutorial is sort of like an introduction. We don't want to scare off the, the the people who are just starting in computer science. But we also want to entertain and keep our seniors and our members who have been here before. So the tutorial that you're about to go through here is sort of a basic touch on HTML and CSS using Bootstrap. And we're also going to get into some fancier uh, JavaScript stuff. Sergio here is a, a, an officer here with us. And he's the one who wrote up this entire tutorial this week. Um, it should take about an hour. Um, if for some reason you guys can't stay or you can't come to our future meetings, Every tutorial that we give inside of uh, the classroom is going to be recorded. Sergio is going to have a screen recorder, so it's not going to be like recording you guys. It's going to be recording the the screen, and he's going to be talking. And so all that stuff will be on YouTube, and we're going to link it to the website. So if you go to usec.com, all of that stuff will be up there for you to kind of go and browse if you miss a meeting, or go back if you miss something. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, it looks like so at least for this one, you're doing web development. Will most of the meetings be using web development as the example of the tutorial? No, so we have a couple. There's a, so Nick Tart of the president of the Software Engineering Club last year wants to come in and do a computer vision tutorial. He works for a local startup company called Paracosm. I don't know if any of you have heard, from, heard about them, but they do computer vision where you know like a robot goes in and it sees and knows what's going on in the room uh, through different devices like Connect and stuff. And he plans on coming using OpenCV, which is a Python framework. And he's gonna do like a basic tutorial on that. Don't worry, I, my eyes glazed over when I first heard that, but it's actually not too bad. It's just basic uh, Python and using a library and implementing a library. That's t towards the middle of the semester, end of the semester. We want to kind of like work our way up from like the beginner kind of tutorials. We decided to start with web because it's sort of like a basic good introduction. We don't want to jump into anything too crazy, but they're all going to be, they're going to be covering different fields basically in different, uh, different languages. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about the bad Apathon last year. But basically what we do towards the end of the semester is we hold a bad op a bad <laughs> appathon, and for eight hours we're gonna go, we're gonna hang out in a room, you guys are gonna create the worst Android or iOS applications that you can create. Um, with trying to be funny, trying to be creative, and then we're gonna have some judges, we'll probably have some like Google swag to give away or some like other random prizes that we might come up with or whatever, um, and hopefully some t-shirts. Um, I think I already covered this, but the, Another big thing is we're pushing, pushing tech companies on you. Who here in the room has had an internship yet? Don't be shy. Okay, so internships are really important and we feel like we should have companies come out and talk about the kind of software that they use and tell you what kind of work you would do working with them. Hopefully they'll be taking resumes or giving like resume um, critiques. Yeah, critiques and some ideas on how you can make yourself uh, More better, yeah, yeah, better known. Um, so that's another thing that we're looking at. So we're gonna go ahead and start this because like I said, it's gonna take about an hour and I don't wanna keep you guys here too long. It's gonna get hot in here too with 100 people. So uh, I'm gonna, well first let me introduce everyone. So my vice president here is Takashi. Hello. And you say your last name. Yeah. Wicks. Yeah, Takashi Wicks. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mark Hello. John Harrison. John. And Sergio Polari. Yes sir. Polari, okay. <laughs> So yeah, we're the software engineering team officer, uh, uh, club officers. If you guys have any ideas for the website, for anything, uh, you're welcome to send it our way. We're gonna be here after the meeting, so if you wanna come up and talk, ask about our experiences, or ask about any, how you can get involved or anything, just stay after the meeting and we'll talk. Yeah, okay? definitely like, feel free to approach us after the meeting. We're, we wanna meet all you guys and get to know you guys. So for sure, come talk to us. And I'm gonna be going through this tutorial. Um, is it, was everyone able to find this page? No problems, cool. So yeah, like I said earlier, you can download the zip file and start and follow along with me. Really quickly, uh, if you haven't, because I know some of you didn't come in, go to usec.com and click the sign in button at the bottom and fill out the Google form. That's just gonna keep, so we know that you were here. At the end of the semester, we're gonna try and give some cool prizes away, maybe a t-shirt or something. Yeah, so download the zip file if you want and you can follow along with me or you can watch and pay attention and Follow through these instructions, which are exactly what I'm gonna be doing today. At home, you can do that. So, yeah, I provided a, a skeleton HTML file to begin with. 
But first off, before we get into the tutorial, who here has web development experience? Cool, so some, but who doesn't? Awesome, majority. Cool. So I'm going to get into, I'm, briefly I'm going to go over the basics of HTML and CSS um, just to show you guys that. So for example, I just have a, a sample index.html file right here. I'm going to go ahead and I just, with Sublime Text, which is the text editor that I'm using, it just went ahead and made a boilerplate HTML file for me with all this boilerplate code. Like, so I don't, no one remembers like all this code you need to like set up to start your web page. I don't remember it. I'll just copy and paste a, a boilerplate from somewhere or use this generator here. So basically all you need to know is H, yeah. All I did was just started typing in like a open bracket and then HTML and then Sublime will like predict it for me. And what is Sublime? It's a text editor. So let me start from there. So when you're doing web programming, other you guys have done like Java or things like that in your first programming class here. Who um, so doesn't have any experience at all programming? I've taken a programming class with you. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so really quickly, uh, this isn't part of the tutorial, but there are a few different ways that you can program. You can program through an IDE, which is like built for that language, or you can program this through a basic text editor. With HTML, there's no front side comp like compiling, it's all done in the browser. So you don't really, you just need a text editor, and that's all this is. Sublime is just a fancy text editor. Super fancy with tons of awesome plugins and cool things. And nifty themes too. So this, yeah, like I was saying, this is the basic HTML boilerplate code. Basically, all you need to know is HTML has tags, like this head tag, and you close your HTML tags with the same tag with a little forward slash at the beginning. So the main two parts of your website are going to be your head and your body. Your head is for like all the metadata of your website, such as the title of your website. So which is only shown like in the tab and your browser and you can also link this is where you'll link your CSS files and your other JavaScript files we'll get into what CSS does in a second so the body of your web page is we're gonna have the body of your web page so HTML like I said is composed of a bunch of tags and what HTML does is it it's kind of like a skeleton and a it just shows tells the browser how your website is gonna be laid out <laughs> For example, say I want to have a, an H1, which is a header, an H1 tag, which is a header, like I said, but there's multiple kinds of header tags. So you have from H1 all the way to H6, H1 being the largest. So so I just made a sample header. And to open up a HTML file, all I need to do is find it wherever you saved it and double click on it. It'll open up in your browser and you'll see my text there, a simple header. So like I said, this looks extremely, extremely basic. It doesn't look like any other website, a professionally done website that you've seen before. So that's where CSS comes in. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheet, something like that. Um, <laughs> in this tutorial, I have like a, like a more in-depth speaking about what these technologies and languages are used for. Basically, CSS will give your web page style. So let's say I want to make this text of this header red. First, I'm going to need to make a CSS file. So what I did here is I targeted my H1 element. You got a question? I'll get into that later. So right now this website's not live or anything. It's just on my, on, or what he said guys was, how do we get to the website like through the internet, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Right now this website is just, I just have the static files on my computer. The website's not on the internet at all. So no one can get to this website. Um, and yeah, to open the, the, to have your browser display the HTML page, you'll just double click on the HTML file in your file explorer on whatever operating system you have. So on my CSS file, I used h1 to target my h1 element. 
what this is called is a selector in CSS. Basically, it selects different HTML elements. Louder? Louder, yeah. OK. So yeah, your selectors select different HTML elements. For example, common HTML elements, let me type out some for you, are A, which is a link, P, which is some paragraph text, uh, the body like you saw, what are some other ones? Div, div exactly, yeah, div, span. So div is like a sectional division. You're going to see a lot of divs, which just kind of like sections out the, the layout of your website. So h1 through h6, like I said, are all headers. And a is going to be a link. p is just some body paragraph text. So these are all common tags in HTML to describe the content that's on your web page. So I use my h1 selector to select all h1 elements on my web page. Now I'm going to go ahead and link my CSS file to my HTML file right here in the head of my HTML. So that's just link, That's just telling my HTML file to look here in this style.css file to get styles for this web page. So now make sure these files are both saved and we can refresh the page and now my header is red. So that's, that's how you're able to add custom styles to your web page. So when you see a web page like Facebook or Twitter or something, they have a gazillion lines of CSS because obviously that was just one tiny little thing. Um, but yeah, there's one little problem with this. The way we selected the HTML H1 header is we made all H1s on our entire website red. So if we, what if we don't want an H1 element to be red? That's where we have classes and IDs that come in. Let me give you an example. So let me give this h1 element an attribute of an ID called red. So in HTML, you can also assign attributes to your elements, such as an ID. Well, we're going to give this h1 element a class of green. So the difference between IDs and classes are that you can assign as many elements that you, as you want your class, but IDs you're only allowed to assign to one element. So that's you use an ID to uniquely identify an element. So only this H1 that has the ID of red what can be targeted when I, when I use the selector on the CSS file. So let me give you an example. So in order to select an ID, you just use a pound sign with the name of the ID. And in order to select a class, you just use dot in the class name. So right here, this is assigning any HTML element with an ID of red, which is this header right here. It's going to give it a color of red. And now only one HTML element can have an ID of red. Now right here, this is getting all HTML elements with a class of green and giving them a color of green, like this h1 and this paragraph text. So let's go ahead and refresh our web page and we see that reflected. We have this other header that's also green and a paragraph text that's also green. So that's a way you can aggregate elements and assign them all a certain style and have all things that are of this class look like this. And then if you want to target a specific element, you can use an ID to target a specific element. So that's some really, really basic stuff uh, from a really basic level about HTML and CSS. So let me get in, let's get into the tutorial now. You're going to learn some more watching me code the website, but that was just some ground basics for you to get a, a gist of exactly what's going on here. So I provided you with the starter skeleton in the zip file. So let's go ahead and open up go ahead and open up the index.html file in 
whatever text editor you're going to want to use. And I'm going to go ahead and also open up the skeleton index.html file in my browser just to show you what it looks like. So this is a skeleton. It's basically just a simple landing page with hello world text and a photo of Albert the Gator. So what this tutorial is about, it's about basic web programming and we're also going to show you how to basically we're going to make a personal website for Albert the Gator. So since you guys are mostly all computer science, computer engineering majors, you're in the technical field, you're going to want to get a job in software engineering, I assume, if you're at the software engineering club. Um, so I would definitely recommend for you guys all to make personal websites. It shows companies that are looking at you that this guy or this girl has like some drive and ambition. They took some time out of their classes to make their own personal website. And it gives you like kind of a face on the internet. You can display your work experience. You can show your resume on there. You can sh have links to different projects you've worked on and your contact information. So I'll show you guys mine real quick. So this is my website. I have a little about page, some work experience some cool things I've made, projects, and some links for my resume, email, GitHub, and LinkedIn. So yeah, it just gives you like a face on the internet and you can have it on your resume, have it when you're applying to jobs and internships and whenever you're applying to anything so people can get a feel for who you are so you're not just a blank face on an application. So yeah, I really recommend making your own personal website. And let me show you guys what the final version of the website is going to look like. So we have this nav bar with a couple sections. We have an about section about Albert the Gator. We have some work experience. He's the lead developer at the UF Software Engineering Club. And we have some projects that Albert has developed and worked on. And we have a neat little blinking cursor animation here. So this is what the final website's going to look like. Now back to the skeleton. Let's get into the code. So. Right when we see off the bat, we see a ton of a ton of stuff in the head. You don't really need to worry about anything in the head. This is all just like metadata and like files you're linking to, like I was saying. So skip all that stuff in the head. You can look back at it later. We're going to go straight to the body. Well, actually, real quick, let me tell you what a couple things in the head are doing. All these links and scripts right here are including different libraries. So a lot of times in web development, you're going to use a ton of different libraries and tools to accomplish your goal. As you see right here, this website already looks kind of sleek. When I was showing you the other like super simple website, the font was really ugly, simply looking, and it was a blank. It was super blank and ugly. So, what I'm using here is um, a CSS library called Bootstrap. Bootstrap was actually developed by Twitter, and they open sourced it. And it's a really, really popular front end library f to make really nice clean looking sites and also make them responsive very easily. So what I mean by responsive is that I mean that your website looks nice on all different devices. So for example, a laptop, a desktop computer, a mobile phone, a tablet, you want your website to look nice on any kind of device when your user views it. Like I'm sure a bunch of you guys have tried to go to websites and on your phone and it looks terrible, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me show you guys how to, you can actually view a website from a mobile device from your browser with the Chrome Developer Tools. So how you open up Chrome Developer Tools is you're going to type in, or you're going to use the hotkey, Control Shift J on Windows or Command Option J on Mac. So go ahead and try that out. It's going to bring up this little console thing down here. And once you get into web programming, you're going to use this a lot. So open that up and click on this little looks like a phone icon right here and that's going to give you it's going to change your screen and everything and if you click up here in devices you can select any kind of device you want so any kind of iPhone any kind of Google <coughs> Nexus phone Samsung Galaxy Notes any kind of device and let's click on an iPhone 5 Do you have a question? Uh, I just had a suggestion as a simpler way you can also just reduce your width on the page it's, it won't always get you to some of the smaller phone sizes but it, it'll show what it will look like on a mobile Right, yeah, so what he was saying is you can just reduce your width on the page and it'll also act like it's on mobile. 
but yeah, when you use the device mode, you're able to select whatever device you want, different laptop resolution sizes also. And But whenever you select a different device, make sure you refresh. So the page refreshes and reacts according to the screen size. So right here we see Bootstrap's website looks pretty nice and fluid on mobile. And even the little nav bar collapsed to a little, you know, so yeah, basically Bootstrap makes it really simple to make your websites responsive and look nice on any kind of device. Um, and yeah, all Bootstrap is, it's basically a collection of CSS and some JavaScript if you want to get into the JavaScript, but we're only going to use the CSS today. It's a collection of just CSS styles that you're going to include on your website. So like how I made my CSS file earlier, we're just stealing all of Bootstrap, not stealing, but we're using all of Bootstrap CSS styles and their classes and every kind of thing they have. So that's what this link is doing right here. This is the latest compiled and minified Bootstrap CSS. So we're just getting this link and it's the Bootstrap CSS file. So what that allows us is to use all of Bootstrap CSS styles in our web page. Okay, so now down to the body, <clears throat> we have this massive nav element which just takes care of the nav bar, which we will get into later. So let's skip past that. And we come across a div with an ID of home. So like I said before, we're going to use divs to section off different areas in our web page. So this is going to be our home section, which is basically what you see here, the hello world with the photo of Albert. So right here is my hello world text inside an H1, and we have an image tag with the source of the image. So that's how this data gets rendered. So let's move on. We're going to go ahead and make a new section. This section is going to be like an about section to just tell the world a little bit about who Albert the Gator is. So we're going to make a new div with an ID of about. And we're going to go to Bootstrap's website and grab a little component from, from Bootstrap. What Bootstrap also has for you is it has a bunch of components that you can use. For example, you have a bunch of neat little icons that you can include on your web page. Like, for example, when you go on websites, I have, like, if you want to make a new tweet, there's a little icon when you, on Twitter, when you want to make a new tweet, there's an icon you can press to, like, compose a tweet. You, you see icons all around on web applications and things like that. So it has, it has some decent amount of icons here, like a little location one, check mark, a bunch of nifty little things. And for example, we have a nav bar that you can use. We have button groups. We have a jumbotron, which is just like a large text, kind of like presentation thing for your web page. Um, there's a bunch of cool stuff on here and it's super easy to use them. I'm going to go ahead and use this page header right now. All I'm going to do is copy this HTML, copy it to my clipboard, and I'm going to paste it in my about div. So as simple as that, I just use their page header component and you see I'm, I'm using class page header on that. That's allowing me to use Bootstrap CSS class of page header. So let's go ahead and clear out all the text in the H1. And we're just going to type in about me. So if we refresh our web page here in the browser, you can scroll down and see we have some about me text down here that I made. And it has a little bar here also, which will look nicer once we have some content under the bar. But real quick, let's go ahead and make this text white since this text up here is white and it looks much nicer on the blue background than this black text. So in the tutorial, I have this CSS code right here that you can copy and paste. And we're going to go into our style.css file and we can paste it anywhere we want. These are all the predefined styles that I made for the web page for the starter skeleton. And we're just going to paste that down here. What this does is it gets an H1, H2, H3, H4 
links and paragraph text and makes them all white. So make sure you save that and refresh your web page and now it's white. Cool. So let's begin to add some about text under this about title. So I'm just going to copy and paste this text that I wrote out here. It's just like a bunch of dummy text. So yeah, basically this is all enclosed in one paragraph tag and we're saying, hey, my name is Albert, blah, blah, blah. And this is just a bunch of dummy text to fill up the space. So if we go back to our web page and we refresh it, we see all of our text rendered there. All right looks good so we can also go on a mobile view and check out how that looks just a nice wall of text but it's nicely formatted for a mobile device okay we're gonna move on and we're gonna start on the work experience section so basically I can just copy and paste this little section because I still want my outer div to section off my different sections and I still want a page header so I'm just gonna remove all the rest of the text and just manipulate what I what I want to keep so we're gonna change the idea of this div to work just to describe this section we're gonna change this header to work experience and we're just gonna delete everything in this paragraph tag So we just have another little section with a title of work experience. And now we're going to go ahead and add a list of jobs that Albert the Gator has had. So I'm going to go back to the Bootstrap website and check out their components. They have a nice little list group component here. It just gives you like a sleek little list here. Normally if you would, if you would make a list it would just be bullet points but this looks a little bit nicer. And as you guys see you use the tag UL for an unordered list and then each item in your list is going to be enclosed in an LI tag. So as you also see we're using a bunch of bootstrap classes here like list group and list group item for each list element. So go ahead and copy that and paste it right below our page header. Feel free to stop me and ask any questions or, or what I'm doing, what does this do, what does that do. That's, that, that's totally cool. So go ahead and save this and refresh our page. And now we have a list of stuff with a bunch of dummy text. So let's go ahead and change that text. Lead developer at UF Software Engineering Club. And we're just going to say he worked at McDonald's for a while before he came to UF. And we're just going to have three elements. He's, he only, he's only had three jobs before. So let's go ahead and refresh that. And we see our new jobs are listed there. Let's go ahead and go back to the Bootstrap Components page again and grab some other components. So there's this little section called Badges, and we see little badges, which could be used on a web, web application for messages and your inbox and, and to describe like the amount of things are, are on some page, like home, profile, messages, which is pretty cool. So we're going to grab a badge, which is just this little span element right here. We're going to copy that and just paste it right next to each of our jobs but still inside the list element tag. 
because these are these are still part of the of each list element. So let's change this to present. Change this to four years and change this to two years. Go ahead and refresh that. So now we see that I guess this page is in Italian. Uh, yeah, now we have all the badges there that denote the time frame of each job. And let's go ahead and check it out on mobile too, just to make sure everything is looking okay. So our about section and our work experience. Cool. Looks good, just a little bit too much text there. But all right, looking good so far. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so in order to use any of Bootstrap's classes or in the badge, for example, you're going to need to include the Bootstrap source in your header file. You can either download it like you said, or you can, what I did was I used the CDN link, which is just going to this online host of the Bootstrap CSS and grabbing it from there. You can do that, which is a little bit easier, or you can download the source and link to it directly on your computer. Right. So guys, he's having some issues with downloading Bootstrap. What I do, the simplest way, is just right at the top of the Getting Started page of Bootstrap, you're going to see these different download options. Let's just go ahead and where it says Bootstrap CDN, literally you can just copy and paste this into the head of your HTML file and that should give you all the bootstrap CSS that you need. And this is just an optional theme and then this is the bootstrap JavaScript which you can include if you want. We're going to use it towards the end of the tutorial a tiny bit. Does that answer your question? Cool. So yeah, now we have our work experience all set up. Let's see what is next. Next, we're going to describe Albert's project. So again, we're going to go ahead and copy and paste our previous div since our whole sectional divisions are going to be the same. We're going to want another div to include our project section on our web page. So we're going to give this an ID of projects. Whoops, I cannot type. And we're going to change the header to projects and delete the whole unordered list. Okay. So let me show you guys what the final site's going to look like for this project section, just to give you an idea of what I'm making right here. So I'm just going to open up the final index.html. And basically it's just three images describing projects that Albert has made and some text, a title text and some text describing what each project was and with links to each project. So are you saying that Albert's the worst programmer ever? He's a great he developed the Gatorway so app and the trends. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Albert, it's a pretty good program. I mean, he made all this stuff, but they don't work the best. Okay. So for the projects, like I was saying, we have three projects right here, and let me show you what happens when we go onto a mobile view. As you see right now, they're all in one row, side by side. When we go into a mobile view, they become stacked because we don't have enough space on a mobile device to show them all in a horizontal row. We want to show them in a vertical row. So the way we do that is we're, we're going to use Bootstrap's grid system. I'm going to kind of fly through this. I have, a, I have some more description on what exactly I'm doing in the tutorial, on the tutorial text. But basically, 
If you go to the, CSX sec the CSS section of Bootstrap's documentation and go to grid system, they describe their whole grid, grid system in, in a really in-depth way. And you can learn a lot about it there. Um, basically, it uses a 12-column grid system to organize elements. And you can, you can um, say, you can organize the grid system per device. For example, for medium devices, for extra small devices, for small devices, etc. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste the code for the project section. And throw that in here. So this is a lot of code. Basically all it's doing is it's giving each element a width of four. So and we have three project elements, little divisions. So four times three is twelve, which gives you a total of twelve columns. Because they each have a width of four. Okay, so let's go ahead and Refresh this, and cool. That came out exactly how it was on the final app. One thing I forgot to do was, if you see this project section has a class of container, that's also a bootstrap class that kind of makes the div element more responsive. I'm gonna go ahead and add that to each other section. Okay, so yeah, it kind of reduced the width and it made it look a little bit nicer. Um, so like I was saying, for the project section, we're just using Bootstrap's grid layout and you can go in, go more in depth into this code. On my tutorial, I kind of described it a little bit more and gave you some more links to how to learn about Bootstrap's grid system. Once you get, it's kind of scary and intimidating at first because you have no idea how do these different column sizes and different for medium sized screens, extra small, small, large how it works, but once you do a couple things with it and mess around with it, it's actually pretty simple and you can use it to do some really cool things to, sh to change how your website looks on mobile devices, devices with smaller screens and devices with larger screens like widescreen desktops. So yeah, <clears throat> you don't really need to know what's going on right here for now, just go with it. A lot of things in software development, you're going to be using a lot of different libraries like Bootstrap and a bunch of other crap, a lot of JavaScript libraries, and they're going to do a lot of the hard work for you. That's totally okay. As software engineers, you're, that's part of the, the process. You're finding these tools to make your life easier. You don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. If you were going to rewrite this code to do what Bootstrap's doing for you, that would be really complicated and really annoying. No one wants to do all that code. So we're going to use the tools that they provide us to make our lives really easier and make our website much nicer. All right. So... Right now we have our about section, our work experience, and our projects. So we're practically done. The one thing I want to add just to spice up our website is we're going to add a little blinking cursor. Let me find the final version right here. So we're just going to add a little blinking cursor right here. To give it like a little, like you're typing in the console or typing in a text editor, a little programmer effect there, just to look, just to look nice. And we're going to use some JavaScript actually to accomplish this. So if we go to my tutorial, you're going to want to copy and paste this little span element. So span ID of cursor. So I'm using the ID to uniquely identify this span HTML element. So we're going to paste that right here, wherever my hello world text is, right next to that. So there's my little cursor. It's obviously not blinking yet. We're going to use JavaScript to make it blink. So back to the tutorial. Like I said before, you're going to use a lot of code in web development and I'm sure in your other in other software areas. 
um, that you don't really know exactly what's going on, but you just kind of go with it because you don't want to reinvent the, real, the wheel, right? So you're going to copy and paste this function called cursor animation. And we're going to go in our script.js file, which is just an empty JavaScript file, and paste it anywhere in there. We can just declare the function anywhere. Um, so let me get a little bit into what JavaScript is. For the front end of your website, you use three languages mainly, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those are like the, the three amigos there. They do everything to display the front end of your website. The front, the front end of your website is what the user sees in your browser. For example, all of this data right here, everything here on this GitHub repository, this is all the front end. All of this all this whole layout and the look of it is all with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, nothing else. And that's where you're going to use your three main tools for your front end, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And probably a ton of JavaScript libraries and CSS libraries and things like that. Like I said, you're going to use as many resources as you can to make your life easier and to make your website look nicer. So what JavaScript does is it, it can, it's able to manipulate your web page. So any web page animations having data that changes. So for mainstream web, websites and web applications like Facebook, Twitter, Google, anything, they definitely have JavaScript in their web page to change data, to <coughs> animate data, to, to do anything that changes. HTML, HTML and CSS is static. Nothing can change with it. So we made this function called cursor animation. All it's doing is it is selecting anything with an ID of cursor, which is just our little span that we copy and paste it next to our hello world text. It's taking anything with the ID of cursor and is calling an animate function on it. So this is actually a little bit of JavaScript mixed in with jQuery. We're already using JavaScript libraries and we don't even know what JavaScript is. So I did that basically when I learned JavaScript, I kind of jumped in right with jQuery jQuery, have, has anyone heard of jQuery before? It's Whenever you hear JavaScript, a lot of times you'll hear of jQuery along with it. Yeah. It's basically a library that makes a lot of things in JavaScript much easier. So we're calling the animate function, and I have more information about this stuff in the tutorial. Here's a link to jQuery's animate function, and it's the function parameters and whatnot. So basically, we are animating the um, little cursor. We're giving it an opacity of zero, which means it's completely invisible. And then we're going to bring it back to an op opacity of one right here, which means it's fully visible. So that's going to help us do the blinking effect. We're going to make it invisible, make it visible. Make it visible, make it visible. Cool. So it's not going to work just yet. We need to add a tiny smidge more of JavaScript code to get this to work. So. Back to the tutorial. We're just gonna need to copy and paste this one little extra bit of code. So what this is doing is it's calling a set interval function, which is a JavaScript function, not jQuery, um, that basically does something on an interval. So we're passing in parameters of our function. In JavaScript, Functions are first-class citizens, meaning they act, they can act as variables. You can pass them around to other functions. They have as much priority as a variable would be, would have. So we're passing it in the function of cursor animation, and we're giving it a time of 800 milliseconds, meaning it's going to call our cursor animation function every 800 milliseconds. So that's what's going to give it a blinking effect. Every 800 milliseconds, it's going to call the function. It's going to make it invisible, bring it back. 800 milliseconds, make it invisible, bring it back and over and over and over again, and it's never going to stop because we want it to be blinking as long as our web page is alive. So that's what the set interval function does. And what this outer stuff here is, document.ready function. Basically what this is, is it's also some, some jQuery stuff. Here's a link to that function. Basically it's kind of like your main method in JavaScript. All it does is it executes whatever code is inside the function whenever your web whenever your web page is ready to be manipulated. So, when you're loading a web page, you need your web page needs to load. It needs to load all the HTML and CSS. 
and he used to do all this stuff to get prepared behind the scenes. Once all that's finished, then this document.ready will execute whatever code, whatever JavaScript code is inside of it. So once our web page is ready to go, we can execute our set interval with our cursor animation. And let's check it out. So cool, we're blinking. And like I said, this is never going to end blinking because we just call set interval and let it go. It's going to be called every 800 milliseconds and it's going to be continuously blinking. So here's our JavaScript, our JavaScript file. We have our own function we made and our document ready function to execute whatever code we want when the web page is loaded. Anyone have any questions about what's going on here? You might, you, obviously you don't know what exactly all the syntax and this weird stuff is, but like how I explained it, you can get the gist of what's going on, right? Does anyone have any questions about kind of like the logic and what exactly the code is doing? Cool. Um, so yeah, we include our script.js file right up here in the head, along with the bootstrap CSS, and right here is the jQuery JavaScript. We also need to include all the jQuery code that we're using. That's how we're able to use the document ready and the animate function, things like that. And also the bootstrap JavaScript. And then like I said, here's our JavaScript file and our CSS file. So the head file again is just for including your different resources and for metadata. Like this little title here for the website which is shown right here in the tab on your web page, Albert the Gator. I can change that. And it will reflect. Hi, so that's the title of your web page. And also if you want a little favicon, which is what websites have when you have icons here, those are favicons. You would also put that, ours is blank because we don't have a favicon. You would also put that somewhere in your head of your, of your website. So. That's a really fast rundown of HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and we made our first website. So one last thing that we didn't take care of are these navigation buttons. Our About button works because it was set up to work. Let me show you where the navigation bar is. It's this massive nav, <coughs> class navbar, navbar default. All that stuff is bootstrap classes, and I literally just copy and paste this whole, this whole nav tag from Bootstrap's component section. That's how simple it is to get a cool nav bar. So if we go into our nav bar code, we see this unordered list right here and a couple of list items with where we see home, about, and contact. Let's go ahead and change that so it works with our website. So we're going to want this to go to work experience and let's copy and paste this and change this to projects. Opening with Thank you. I forgot my opening tag right here for my list item real quick. So real quick about HTML and CSS and JavaScript. These are not programming languages necessarily. They're not compiled. So for example, if you've run Java or C++ or code like that, you have to compile that code and if I were to mess up with something in the syntax, the compiler will give me an error and I won't be able to compile my code and I won't be able to run my program. That's not the case here with these kind of languages that are interpreted by the browser. The code would still run in the browser. Um, this will probably still work. Let's see. Yeah, it still works, but there's some weird li text right there and some funky stuff's going on. So no error is going to be thrown at me. Nothing's going to complain, but the website's not going to look how I want it if I make mistakes. So it's cool and it's bad. <laughs> so you can make mistakes and not know you have mistakes until you notice something acting weird on your website. But yeah, so let's go ahead and fix these links. So I used some links in the code below for my projects, but I'm going to go ahead and describe how an A element works. So you always use an A element for links. And for href, you'll give it your the address you want to link to. For example, let me go down to the project section, and I have href isis.ufl.edu. That gives that makes the link go to the isis website. So you have a href, and you give it your link, and then you can just give it the text you want in between the opening and closing a tags. 
So for our navigation bar buttons, we're not going to want to link to any different website. We just want to link to different parts on our page. So if you see this pound sign about, pound sign contact, remember pound sign and some word means you're, you're trying to select an ID. So that's why we gave all of our different sections IDs of about, projects, work, etc. So we can uniquely identify them and do cool stuff like link directly to them. So we're going to go to href pound sign work and href pound sign projects. So we can go, this will just go straight to the part on our website. The H, this will go straight to the HTML element in our website that has an ID of about, that has an ID of work, and that has an ID of projects. So yeah, we just saw another our projects button pop up right there. All we have to do is just copy and paste and make another list element. So this will bring us down to our projects section. This will bring us back up to our about, and we're good to go. And just go ahead and check out the website on mobile and make sure everything is looking good also. So right off the bat, you notice again that the navbar collapses to a nice little mobile drop down button thing. That's also some bootstrap code that does that right for you right out of the box. So these buttons still work on mobile as well. Awesome. Cool. So. This sample a little personal website is pretty much complete. I highly recommend you guys to use this as a basis for a personal website for yourselves. Like I was saying before, it's super, super, super beneficial to, to make one of these for yourself and to just give yourself a space on the internet. Um, definitely use this as a basis for making your own website. But I mean, change it up because we don't want a bunch of people with the same exact website. Um, and also, like the, the question earlier, a really, really cool and easy way to make this website live and online because, I mean, that's all we're making websites for is to have them on the internet. We don't want them only on our computer. So a cool way to do this is to use GitHub pages. Who here has heard of GitHub? I'm sure in your classes you've heard of GitHub. Okay, the majority. So GitHub is kind of like a it – you can host all your code on there in simple terms. You can host code and projects and things like that. And it's also used for version control. That's what it's mainly used for. <laughs> but GitHub offers this thing called GitHub Pages where you can, it'll host websites for you for free for yourself and for any kind of projects that you host on GitHub. So they have awesome directions right here on how to host your website for free. All you need to do is have a GitHub account and then you need to follow these super simple instructions. So you're going to want to make a user site. And it gives you instructions. Basically what you need to do is you need to make a repository. And a repository is just like a folder basically that houses your code, any projects you make. And it's going to be your username on github.github.io. And you need to put all your website code in that repository or folder. And once that's live on GitHub, it's a live website. Your username.github.io. So let me show you mine, for example. Mine is also, my GitHub username is spolari.github.io. Is gonna, this will go to my website, but since I have a custom domain, it's going to redirect to my domain. But the link works, spolari.github.io will, um, will go right to my website. And let me show you real quick my repository for that code. Yeah. How do you get the custom domain? How do, how do I get the custom domain? Yes. So yeah, you can buy custom domains for pretty cheap and a really good website for that is Namecheap. So you can search for a domain. What's your name? Seven. What was that? Seven. S-E-V. S-E-V. Wait, seven? <laughs> Okay. One million dollars. Yeah, this is probably going to be in a really expensive domain. So yeah, I mean, obviously you can't even buy all these because they're already already they're owned by people. But let me just do my my first and last name. 
So yeah, SergioPolari.com is only $8.88 a year. So you can get cool custom domains for pretty cheap. That's definitely <laughs> worth it. Yeah. That is a dot me website. Yeah, so you get you don't get the dot com, you get like Joshua Kegley dot me, which is the same thing. It's, it links the same way, but you do get a yeah. free one. What do we get? Well, I have to look up uh, GitHub student package, and you have to like apply for that with your email, and you get like all the information to do it. Yeah. So if you want a free dot me um, domain name, you can get that through GitHub student <coughs> package, apparently. So yeah. Let's go back, let's find the repository. So like I said, here's my repository for my personal website. The repository is called spilary, my github username.github.io. And here's just all the code for my website. Once, the, once your code is in this repository, GitHub automatically makes your website live at this URL. And it's that simple. So that's an awesome way to get you up and running on the internet really easily and really fast, just in time for career fair. So, I definitely recommend doing that. Yeah. So I have a Wix account. Is what we're doing right now just replacing my whole Wix account? Because I'm paying for Wix. I have no idea what Wix is. It's like a WYSIWYG editor. It's, it's, uh, it's a WYSIWYG website. Basically, yes. It's like a free template. And it's free, though. Unless you buy a hundred of your customers. I'm sorry, say that again. Like, it's basically the same thing, but just uh, unless you're paying for like a custom domain, it's, it's, it's free. It's the same thing. Yeah, okay. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, and also, no, if no questions, be sure to check out the tutorial. It's right off of our website, ufsec.com, slash personal site tutorial, whatever. You guys know the URL. Right, before you go, really quick, let's thank Sergio for this tutorial. So, all of you probably, I mean, you guys have all heard of GitHub. Who here is an expert at using GitHub? I mean, I mean, you can be modest or not modest, I don't care. So to, uh, Thursday at 6 o'clock, uh, the Association of Computer Engineers, it's, a new, it's our newest club here at uh, uh, UF in the Computer Science Department, they're hosting a GitHub tutorial. They're going to do everything from posting to repositories and updating and branching. They're also going to create your first like basic website. They're just going to take what we, basically kind of what we created today and just upload it to GitHub.io so that you know how to do that, how to create a custom website. I, um, I wanted to mention, what is that? Uh, that's Thursday at 6 o'clock. There's a Facebook invite on the CS, the CS Computer Science face or UF Computer Science Facebook group. What code group. is that? That's ACE. Associ -E. Association for Computer Engineers, ACE. Yeah, I have, so it's not been, they don't have a room yet because the group also is growing really, or the event's growing really big because there's going to be a lot. Uh, Marcial is actually going to be, be one of the presenters there. Um, there's a bunch. There's like four or five guys going to be presenting a <coughs> topic. Um, I mentioned the bad appathon at the beginning of the meeting. I just wanted to point out that we're going to be building Android and iOS apps using Swift or Java. We're going to be giving you the tutorials the week before that. So we're going to be, uh, Sergio is going to do an iOS tutorial. John is going to do an Android JavaScript or Java tutorial. And then that Saturday, we're going to go in, we're going to spend eight hours together, and we're going to build the worst applications we can come up with, OK? <laughs> we'll have some really dumb ideas that turn out to be something cool, something to laugh about. And then we're going to probably give like top five prizes away, maybe the most ridiculous app, uh, maybe disqualify for people for like creating like spam apps or something. I don't know. So some fun stuff. So make sure to look out for the Facebook page for that. We're also. Uh, all of the computer science groups, uh, computer science clubs at UF, the ACE, uh, UF Computer or uh, Software Engineering Club, the programming team, and WIXI, the Women in Computer Science and Engineering, we're all getting together. We're hosting next year's Swamp Hacks. I don't know. Did anybody go to Swamp Hacks last year? Does anyone know uh, what a hackathon is? Eh, kind of. So, if you want to explain. Okay. It. So yeah. basically, a hackathon. Hmm. Okay. I was, really trying, to, I was trying to find out if I can find something online, but. Google what a hackathon is. Basically, you get together with a bunch of other programmers and like-minded people. You make some cool shit. You actually spend, you, you can spend from 24 hours straight. Some hackathons are 24 hours, some are 36 hours. You spend all that time straight working on cool projects. Usually no sleep. Yeah, you usually don't sleep. You can take a nap here and there. Um, you make some, you work on some cool things and a bunch of them are hosted by really awesome <coughs> companies. You can network with cool companies normally learn a bunch of new skills and they have really awesome prizes and rewards and just a, a really good way to like build your skills network with companies and, and like-minded people and just a really awesome opportunities 
So last year at Swamp Packs, John, me, and Danny in the back were part of Swamp Packs, and we actually were the first place winner. So it was our first year. We just walked in with no idea. We spent the first two hours arguing about what idea we wanted to do, you know, creative arguing, not like we weren't being mean or anything. And uh, we programmed for 24, 18 hours, actually. It was only 18 hours. And we created a, a, what's called Schedule Chomper. It's not really released yet, so don't go looking for it. But basically, it was just an application that helped you um, <coughs> Uh, students at UF like automatically schedule your classes. You basically put what major you're in, and then you pick some of the classes that you want, and then it finds the best possible schedule for you, and then it shows you that, and then it allows you to. So it was like a really quick web application that we built using some of the stuff that you've seen here: Bootstrap, CSS, JavaScript, all that stuff. Real, real quick. You don't need to be good at programming to go to these hackathons too. That's what they're for. They're for to learn. They're for you to learn. So like, even if you're like super intimidated by everything, all these different technologies and languages. If you're not confident in your programming abilities at all, still go. Like, you're going to learn by going. You, you, you're gonna have to go get on a team and you're gonna be forced to do stuff and you're gonna inevitably learn new things. So it's just a good opportunity for everyone, even super beginners. So yeah, it's good for people. Don't be think, afraid. Super beginners, people, go. <laughs> it's good for people who think they're experts too because you go there and you realize you know nothing and then you yeah. have to learn it all over again. And there's also free food. They gave us Chip uh, not Chipotle, Tijuana Flats. They gave us donuts. I mean, all that stuff was free. We got free T-shirts, stickers, a bunch of free yeah. crap. And everyone likes. Let me show crap. you an example of, for example, a, a lot of kids from here are going to M Hacks this weekend, which is a hackathon at University of Michigan. So there's this 36 hours long. Um, let's see. Here's their schedule. So here's their sponsors. We have Walmart, Apple, Google. So really Microsoft, quick on the sponsors. These companies are going to be at this hackathon, and they're going to be taking your resumes. They're going to be walking around looking at the applications you're building. They're probably going to offer a few pointers. We had a couple companies last year, like so excited, following our group from the beginning to the end, wanting to see like our algorithm work out, or they wanted to see what our final result were. So they're going to all. A lot of these companies are going to be on site talking about what they do and how you can like. And it, basically, it's an opportunity for you to stand out. Yeah, and they're going to be scoping you out and. A lot of the judges judging the projects are going to be from these big companies and stuff. So if you place in like the top couple of projects, you'll these these people from these companies will know who you are. Yeah. Is there are you guys going to have like all the things you were talking about like when you were going to build the apps and Yes, we have a schedule like on the website ufsec.com and there's a schedule there. It's your calendar, you just a calendar. It's going to have all of our meetings. We have a meeting 2 weeks from today, so same uh, same two it's like a Tuesday same time. It'll probably be in a smaller room because, I mean, most of you, uh, like, we like to, like, everybody likes to spread out when they come and stuff, but we haven't really decided what we're going to be covering, but it's mainly going to be prep for the uh, career showcase in CDW. Has anybody been to career showcase in CDW? That's my last point. Okay, so it can seem intimidating, but it's really not. So at CDW, they're there to listen to you and find out what you want to do, and if they just happen to have something for, have something that matches up with that, they're going to offer you an interview and to come in and talk to their company, okay? And so we want to prepare you for that. We want to look at some of your resumes. We want to show you our, our portfolio websites, our GitHub accounts, and we want to show you- LinkedIn stuff. LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a big one. I get contacted on a weekly basis on LinkedIn from companies, okay? And I don't look for that stuff. Like, they just come to me and say, hey, we saw your LinkedIn profile. We'd like to chat with you. So yeah, we're going to, like, help prepare you guys for the whole fall recruiting season, resume reviews, prepare you for the career fair. What so to I do, have blah, a blah, blah. coding interview book, and I'm going to bring that that day also. So if a few of you want to sit down and talk about some of the, the coding in the back, we can do that. Not all of the interviews that you'll go through are going to be that challenging. Only some of the top companies like Google and Microsoft will. Most interviews I've been through, I didn't even get a technical yeah. question. There's yeah, usually like, like a behavioral question like <laughs> what kind of projects have you worked on, that kind of stuff. Yeah, like a lot of times they'll just ask you about things you've worked on. So that's why it's really important to work on things and do things. Like I said, and going to a hackathon will give you an excuse to work on something. And when you're interviewing with these companies and talking to your recruiters, they want to hear what you've worked on, what you've made. If you haven't really worked on anything, if you don't really have much to talk about about your experience. Yeah. But also, when you're going to the career fair, even if you're a super beginner, and even if you haven't worked on anything, you should still go because free swag. It's, yeah, free you, get free, you get free stuff. And also, it's nervous. People get nervous talking to these companies. I know I do all the time. And, but after you go and you talk to a bunch of recruiters over and over again, like it's they just like having a normal question. conversation. They ask the same questions. You say the same thing. You're going to get less and less nervous, and you'll just gain experience. So even if you're not confident in your abilities, you haven't worked on too much stuff, you don't have too much programming experience, still go for the experience and so to gain 
to not be nervous anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean. Okay, so that's it. We're done lecturing. Uh, so next meeting, two weeks from today. I, I'm glad you guys all came out tonight. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to talk to us. Ask us any questions.